so much. Terry was very concerned uh, when uh, Ellen and uh, this is his wonderful wife that I'm going to introduce in a minute. But um, he was very concerned when they were planning all of this in the later stages of his disease uh, that we, we buried him in Jersey yesterday and then he was concerned that we were all going to be here, and where was he going to be? He, <laughs> he would have loved to see you all. And he also, his next comment was, no one's going to show up. No one's going to Who's going to come? Who's going to, come? Who's going to, come? Who's going to be here? And um, I, I'm so happy to say that every aspect of, of Terry's life is here. Our, our life began together almost 50 years ago at a wonderful place, a boys' home called Melville House. And tonight, guys that live there and guys that work there have come together um, to be here. And then it expanded, uh, you know, to the law practice. And Judge Gargiulo was here, and he, he and I started the firm. And Kevin Fox came and joined us, and Kevin's here. And then Terry came and began his legal career um, using much of the things he learned in working in the boys' home. Everybody knows of his legendary compassion, his legendary ability to listen, to understand, to never judge anybody. And all of those things that I had got to observe early on in, in the boys' home, Terry translated it to his practice of law and kept all of those qualities and applied it to everybody he represented. So I've been sending people up to, to Ellen all night, people that Terry turned, changed their lives around completely, uh, men and women. And uh, I wanted her to hear all the stories that I've been getting phone calls and letters and all sorts of things. So we're here to celebrate his life because if anybody deserves celebration, it's him. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, can, I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you that Although this is a, a tremendous loss personally, because he was my soulmate, my therapist, my everything, he he, um, I'm 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 very happy because we know what he went through, and we we lived through it with his diabetes and his dialysis and his transplant and his cancer, and I I've never in my life ever met a human being endured the amount of pain that he endured without complaint. Never, never complained. And um, the lady next to me here is his angel because she never left his side, always was there. I'm gonna have her introduce some of the family that was always there. And, um, and then we have some people that I hope are gonna 
feel free to talk. We have some people that signed up, but don't be shy. Today's a day to celebrate his life. And if you moved after I call the people up, please just raise your hand, come on up, as short as you want to talk about it. But I, I want him to hear it all because he didn't think you were showing up tonight. So. <laughs> he was worried about that. Yeah. So to see a full room like this and to see these faces and the people that have meant so much to me in my life and so much to Terry in his life because this is what he lived for. He lived for people. He lived for helping people and caring for people, listening to people, consoling people, representing them. And I mean, I can go on for forever and ever, but I want all the other people to talk. But first, this, this amazing woman who took my buddy by, by the hand and, and led him through so much uh, trial and tribulation. And uh, it, was, it was a difficult journey, but uh, Thank you. Ellen. Thanks, John. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I know Charlie talked about um, Mellow House and Hope House, and we have relatives here. We have high school friends here. We have lots of friends from Camp Mahitu, which is an organization that I've been involved with for many, many years. And, you know, I, Terry, actually, Terry knew about it when we were in high school. He picked me up for time off one time when we were about 18. <laughs> and um, when we drove back in 30 some odd years later, he said, oh, this place is just the same. You know? <laughs> but um, he embraced that organization and really helped the organization to thrive. Some of you attended our casino nights events that, that we put on here on Long Island and we so appreciate your support. Um, he uh, So he was just involved, you name it, he was involved with it. And when Terry talked to you, he made you feel like you were the most important person in the world. And you were to him. And he really, um, he, I think he gave you all that vibe when you spoke to him and you interacted with him. He was such a good listener. I think that was one of his greatest traits. So um, thanks for coming. We have his two brothers here, Mike and Rick. Their partners, Val and Bruce. My children here, Laura and Craig. And my brother and sister-in-law, my two cousins. And there's another cousin-in-law someplace over here. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, Thank you all so much for coming, and we'd love for you to say some words about about Terry. So um, Charlie's the MC, so take it over. <laughs> so one last thing about uh, Ellen. So Terry said to her and to me many times that because uh, she is a dynamo, she's always busy running around like a like a nutcase that that, that I am. And she said, he said to her, I feel like I married my partner. Uh, without the mustache. <laughs> said that to me many times. Many, many, many times. times. But, <laughs> so I'm going to ask uh, Danny Rogers uh, first to come up and speak. Danny, um, I, and I got to have all of these little comments. Danny, I met um, at Melville House. He was a, a renegade running around. And I, I broke up a fight, and he kicked me right in the chops with steel-toed boots. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, as I looked at him, because I wanted to punch him at the time, but I didn't. It was very good. I said, someday you're going to pay for that. <laughs> a few years later, we were on a canoe trip in the Adirondacks with a bunch of guys, and he fell, broke his leg, and I walked up to him, and I said, I told you you were going to pay for that. <laughs> and with a defiant attitude, he looked up at me, and he said, but now you've got to carry me out of here. <laughs> that's Danny, always the last word. <laughs> so when I was in law school, I was living at Melville House and working, and uh, I used to study in the back, and he was an insomniac who came back and would say, look at me and say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a lawyer. It's going to be Russo and Rogers someday. And uh, I said, you can't even get out of high school. I don't know how you can do that. <laughs> but he got out of high school and got out of college, went to law school, became an assistant district attorney in Suffolk County, and uh, now is a practicing attorney. He's one of Terry's closest friends. Uh, you know, T Terry and him were, were just like uh, brothers, and it was a beautiful thing to watch. I 
turn it over to him. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. I, I do want to say that in the end, everything worked out okay because after that incident with Charlie, I think he went on to have four more children, so <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. Um, I was trying to think of what to say uh, today in regards to Terry, and the only words that came to mind were, it's a life. And, um, you know, it's a life. And, and what I mean by that is, and, and you'll forgive me this indulgence, I'd like to talk about my life, not Terry's, so that I can explain to you why Terry is so important. Uh, I'm going to bring you back a few decades, almost 50 years, the mid-1970s. And I think at the time, Gerald Ford was the president. Nelson Rockefeller was our vice president. And um, I was on the roof. I was 16 years old. I was on the roof of a four-story brick building. I was a former convent. And uh, sitting there, black leather motorcycle jacket, a six-pack of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer, contemplating life, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I was not headed for a good place. My entire life goal was to be a hell's angel. That's what I wanted to do. And I was well on my way. And suddenly I, I look down, it's the middle of the day, and I'm drinking my beer, and I look down and I see this little Pontiac sunburn <laughs> coming up the driveway. <laughs> and I saw this, he was a kid at the time, right out of college, right out of Buffalo, and I thought to myself, oh, a new counselor. And I thought to myself, being a veteran at that point of multiple foster homes and group homes and reform school and lockups, and I thought, fresh meat, this is great. <laughs> um, but what ended up happening was, you know, Terry didn't drop a dime on me about the beer, so I didn't get in trouble. He saw me, and I saw him, and of course, that earned my respect. And we became friends after that. By some small miracle, I ended up getting out of Melville House, and I did go to college, and I graduated. And then I was lost. I, I didn't know what I was going to do, and a couple of years go by, and I hadn't seen Terry for a few years, and I... And I looked at him one day and I said, where have you been? And he said, oh, I went to law school. I said, you did? He just sort of disappeared for three years. And I said, what do you mean you went to law school? He said, yeah, I went to Kansas and I went to law school. And I looked at him, I said, you went to Kansas? I said, what's in Kansas? He said, absolutely nothing except the girls' high school volleyball team. So, <laughs> so all you could do was study. The point was, was that suddenly I realized you know what? I can do this. I can go to law school. I, I, he did it. He did it for three years. He just disappeared. And so I sold everything I owned and I packed up and I did one better. I went to Toledo to go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> My point is that, you know, I think back and I think, what if I hadn't become a lawyer? Um, my wife is here as much as I love her. If I had become a hell's angel, she would not be my wife. Right? <laughs> she never would have married me. I have a beautiful 16-year-old son. I wouldn't have him. I wouldn't have 30 years of being a respected lawyer in the community, doing good things and having a, a wonderful life. And I owe all of that in such a large part to, to him. And that one conversation we had where he just looked at me, he said, I just went to Kansas. And I thought to myself, when I was thinking about what to say today, I said, you know, life is like that. Sometimes you, you reach a corner and you make a left instead of making a right. And then something happens and you meet somebody that you weren't supposed to meet. And then something else happens and it leads to something else. And life is like that. And uh, I'm fortunate that um, I had Terry Carl in my life for so many <laughs> decades. And um, for that, I'll always be grateful. Um, just a reminder, folks, see that little box on your license, organ donor? Mm -hmm. Please check that box. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. I, I told a, a quick little story yesterday. Danny just reminded me when Terry, well, we, we were living at Hope House and Terry came for an interview. And uh, he walked into the room where he was being interviewed and there were five of us in there. And we all had these huge beards, big bushy beards. And Terry walked in and said, oh no, because he was clean shaven. And I, 
He said, what, what's the matter? Because my mother told me to shave my beard off yesterday <laughs> because it wouldn't look good in the interview. <laughs> Danny reminded me of that about when he, the, the, the car pulled up the driveway. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Elise to step up, Elise Kraft, who uh, was our my paralegal and, you know, an, another soulmate of Terry's during the time she was with us at the firm. Elise? Great segue with Kansas. Toby is having the same thing. Good segue with Kansas as I start. I think I'll miss you most of all, Scarecrow. The first person that Dorothy met in Oz was Scarecrow. Friendly, loyal, lovable, humble, memorable. That was Terry. He had enough of that same scarecrow persona for everyone. Selfless friend, supportive boss, brilliant, passionate attorney. Always a gentleman. Everyone loved Terry. <laughs> the perfect combination of big brother, master social worker, and quite often the office bartender, all wrapped in a riddle along with a license to practice law. 29 years ago, almost to the day, I interviewed for my first full-time paralegal position. It turned out to be a comfortable, funny interview. Terry and one of his partners asked me how old I was. And I replied, you can't ask me that. <laughs> to which we all laughed. Ice broken, Terry always found a way to laugh, to make you laugh, and to make everyone feel comfortable. Yesterday morning, I was staring into my backyard. I spotted this tiny, bright red cardinal. It was pretty cold out, and I had never seen one that small before. It hung out for a bit, it tossed some bread, and it watched it until it flew away. And then I thought, maybe it was him telling me that he was okay, and he's free to fly. For 21 Christmases, I participated with Terry and the girls in picking out an office tree, big shiny wreaths, and a few bottles of wine, so that 400 Town Line Road, Suite 170, became his own Andy Williams Christmas special. <laughs> The last work day before Christmas, a tremendous display of beautifully wrapped and perfectly organized presents would magically appear under the tree, sometime in the wee hours of the morning. No one ever really saw him do it. Every gift he selected was thoughtful and personal. He always took the time, made the effort, and as a result, you felt the love. It was funny to see new employees' reactions at his brand and level of office holiday pageantry. For years, everyone got a matching shirt, jacket, hat, blanket. <laughs> Terry only had one rule for the celebrations in our office, and that was put any and all gripes or issues aside. He often said to me that that is what Christmas meant to him. And while Charlie Russo may be Santa Claus, Terry Carl was the unsung, high exalted mystic elf, the most untraditional traditionalist you'll ever meet. One year he purchased a Hanukkah blanket as we used to decorate the lobby inside the building also. He draped it on a bench, all feng shui-like, and then the next morning, he found a homeless guy sleeping on it under the blanket. <laughs> Mazel tov, right? <laughs> Terry was always a go-to guy in the office. If you wanted something done, you went to Terry. Getting a divorce? See Terry. Run a red light? See Terry. Come to work five, five years, <laughs> come to work late five years in a row? See Terry. <laughs> Not enough town of Brookhaven election signs in your neighborhood? See Terry. For many years, he arranged and executed an annual office morale trip in what he would call the big obnoxious car. We ventured to places from Atlantic City to East End Vineyards, and in the photo montage of yesterday and today, you may see him laughing in a wine-covered wine covered sweater. Right here. <laughs> Compliments of me. It was a driver's fault. <laughs> and the puns over the puns and the cliches and the movie lines. As a fellow Gemini, I always found this one line, his one liners funny, no matter how many times he said them. Right. And it was never not funny when he said, walk this way. The following walk. <laughs> then there were the stories. He knew all the stories, and then the stories behind the stories to the backstories of the stories that were uh, Russo, Carl, and all the other people on the letterhead from 1983. He loved to talk about growing up in North Merrick. We would joke about um, 
saying, go right at Jim Jan Cleaners every time he would hear me or I would hear him giving directions on the, on the phone. Um, everything eventually was a not so private joke within our little faction of work friends. I once bought a make your own Monopoly game and it was a kit that you kind of personalize it to whatever theme you wanted to. So I ended up calling it Terry Carlopoly <laughs> and it had all his names and facts and places from his stories. So um, you, uh, from the stories like the teacher that made him tingle when he drove by in his car with his parents, um, his North School play debut um, when he was lighting. And then um, so the game would go, let's say, you get caught in jaywalking, caught jaywalking on Jerusalem Avenue, go directly to jail. Do not collect $200. And then you get a free arraignment card from Terry, of course. <laughs> and that way you were able to move about your day and buy your hotels and your houses. <laughs> All right. So peanut butter is the glue that holds life together. In 1996, Terry and I each wrote cheeky poems and submitted them to Peanut Butter Lovers Club. We found it on the internet. <laughs> While we didn't win, we both received a congratulatory letter along with a highly coveted peanut butter lover's checkbook cover with matching bookmark. <laughs> I believe his entry was an ode to peanut butter, which was a Dr. Seuss-like dedication to his lifelong love affair with Skippy. <laughs> and always the first to show up when you needed support, whether it was a wedding or a backyard party or a 5K walk, always the first to write a check for any and all charities anyone was involved in. When he reunited with Ellen, he became a driving force raising money for Camp Mahitu, and that was her childhood camp. And um, they had an annual ca casino night that he pretty much threw the whole thing, right? Planned it and executed it. They were great times, they all were. I'm a better person for having spent so much time with him through the years, and my reward going forward are all these great memories. Hopefully, triggered a few for you guys. I have. Uh, I, I had a picture, but I think it might be in this uh, montage of my son, Jake, who's now going to be 25, on uh, his shoulders. And to me, that was one of my favorite pictures in the whole world. Um, so, Terry, I'm sorry I spilled wine all over you in a limo. I still have your Billy Joel CD. I'm really, really sorry about the time I accidentally threw your lunch out. <laughs> That's right, it was me. <laughs> Lunchgate, him with Lunchgate. Solved. Mea culpa. It feels good. <laughs> Our losses, heaven's gain. I know there are plenty of people here that have a lot more years on than I do, but I thank you. I thank you, Terry. I thank you for all your unwavering friendship, your wisdom, your generosity, your perspective, and your advice. Thank you for keeping us all afloat. And remember, it turns out it doesn't take a village, it takes a Terry. <laughs> so the, the inside joke about the, uh, the food. Uh, yesterday, um, during my eulogy, I mentioned the fact that we've been together for 50 years and never had an argument, except once. And that's, um, <laughs> Terry rarely got upset, but someone took his, his leftovers, which he cherished. <laughs> and, uh, when, when Terry was angry, which is very rare, his voice would sound like a soprano in the same Killian's voice clock. You know, it would just go up. And, uh, and uh, I said, you're yelling at me. I go, I didn't touch your food. And we never could find out. And it's very nice to know <laughs> at this moment in time that it wasn't Jose, the maintenance guy, <laughs> who's been taking the heat for it. <laughs> I told you to clean the fridge I didn't recognize it. <laughs> the next day, someone took his apple, and I came in with an apple that I had and just started eating it. <laughs> that raised his voice. Also. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Meredith to come up. Is Meredith here? Oh, yes, Meredith. Okay. Terry's cousin. Yeah. Okay. Thank so, you. I, I wasn't going to talk, but I am. So, um, yeah. Um, so, life's a series of moments. Um, and you never know when you're going to have a moment. You know, that changes everything. And 
maybe 20 years ago, I um, just started working at Citibank, um, 150 Motor Parkway, and I was going to an event, and I had my business cards and my name tag, and I had just gotten a title client financial officer. I was like 26. I just bought my own house. You know, it was crazy on my own, you know, just doing my thing. And I'm at this event and someone comes up to me and says, we have the same last name. We have the same eyes. I think, where are you from? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, hop up now, like, or then, or when? And he's like, you know, like, from? And he said, well, I grew up in Levittown. And he's like, your family? I was a mom's from Queens. My dad's from Franklin Square. And his face lit up. He's like, where's your dad? And I'm like, Donald. He's like, I'm his cousin. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, family. And what are the odds, you know, that this, I just bought a house. I just start my life. I just got a job. I just, on my own. And I walk into a meeting in a, the Hop Hog Small Business, Ichikaya, whatever that thing, Ichikaya is been a while. I'm getting old too. <laughs> so, and, and then I bump into a relative who recognizes the blue eyes. And he's like, you know, only the cool girls have the blue eyes. <laughs> it's true. Um, the cool girls do the charity work too, apparently, with the blue eyes. It's the blue eye gene, you know. Um, you know, from that moment, you know, I, our families hadn't spoken in, I don't know, probably years. And I got to put my family back together. So my dad hadn't talked to Terry. I wasn't even existing. Because when my grandfather and Terry's father were younger, they got on a stupid fight. Because life is a series of moments. And we have good moments and bad moments. And um, I started to do charity work, and I just started to bug Terry every stupid legal question I ever had. And it's funny, I was listening to everybody talk about, call Terry. Goes, yeah, pretty much. Uh, my dumb musician friend gets in a DWI in Poughkeepsie because he's an idiot. Ask Terry. You know, <laughs> um, I need to figure out how to get a bunch of Afghans to Pakistan in the three in the morning. <laughs> Email Terry. You know, I'm starting an animal rescue. I don't know what I'm doing. Is this right? Is this lease going to make sense? as Terry. And uh, I don't know who I'm going to bother anymore. I'm just not paying people now. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to kill our budget. But. Um, <laughs> You know, I went from working in finance to working for the government, and now I'm just uh, partially disabled running a nonprofit, and I'm responsible for 150 animals and over 200 people who have nothing. And if it wasn't for people like Terry, you know, the world would be a horrible place. So in Terry's memory, if everybody could just leave here and every day remember to do something kind, <laughs> because he was the kindest person. Which is if you do one nice thing, it's contagious. So just even if it's just say thank you, hold a door, um, ask someone if they're okay. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Because all the tiny stuff we do is going to add up to really awesome things. And we just lost a really awesome person, so we sort of have to make up for that. Okay? Thank you. So um, we also... Tonight, you know, we, we talked about Melville House, and Hope House was a huge part of uh, Terry's life. Um, for the past 43 years, it's our anniversary this year, it'll be 43 years. Terry's represented so many guys that they are here tonight, a lot of them, that did, that changed their lives around, you know, uh, that changed their lives around completely, and they're here tonight. Um, and I've asked a couple of them to speak. Uh, Tom Christensen just drove up from Carolinas, and I'm going to ask Tommy to step up wherever he's hiding and, uh, and say a couple of words. <laughs> Last night, I knew I had to drive all the way up, and it's not a terribly long drive, but it's long enough, and I'm getting older, and I wanted to go to bed early so that I'd be fresh. And the privilege to share about Terry in the best possible way kept me up. And I don't 
generally wrestle with sleep, but it was so important to me to express what he meant that I spent three hours lying in bed thinking about him in a way that I had not for some time, and that's on me. And there were a couple of things that bubbled up to the surface that for me, I would like to share with you. The first thing that people have mentioned already, but the thing that came to me was his eyes. And I was like, oh, I remember his eyes because they were amazing. I was like, no, I remember his eyes because he shared them with me. I remember his eyes because he would listen to me. Why did I know Terry? I knew Terry because they took a chance on letting me work at their law firm, right? I'm kind of a messed up mid-something 20 kid that doesn't really know his ass from his elbow. And they took a chance on me. This is a professional. I am entering a professional's world, and this man gave me his eyes. He gave me his ear, and he listened to everything that I had to say. And for somebody that was trying to find themselves, was trying to find their own self-respect, he gave it to me before I had it in myself. The second thing I remember is when he would come back from court, maybe it was 1 o'clock, maybe it was 2 o'clock, depending on how many cases he had to adjourn that day, because that's what I learned about law, especially criminal law, is adjourn, 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 and eventually you wear the judge out, I guess, that's how it works. You would hear two sounds when he came in the office. You would hear the scrape of the glass as he pulled out the coffee pot and poured himself a cup, and you would hear his socked feet on the carpet. <laughs> And as much as we've talked about the fact that he didn't like to wear shoes, it also to me meant this was a man that wanted to be with us, but he didn't need to announce that he was there. He didn't need to be the star. He didn't have that type of ego. He just wanted to be home with this family that we had built in this firm at this time. And I... I have never known somebody to be so full of life and so short on ego. Normally it's the biggest people in our lives are also the biggest people in our lives. And I struggle with that because sometimes like, I'm not sure if I'm giving everything that I can. But he was so authentic in what he gave all of the time that I realize that over the last... 10 years, as I reflected last night, he is the kind of adult that I am attempting to grow up to be. And I think, for better or worse, if I had figured that out in time to tell him, he was so humble, I don't know if he would have heard me. But now I'm pretty sure he's a captive audience. <laughs> so hear me, bro. I'm trying to be you when I grow up. Okay? Thanks. Let's see who I have here. Phyllis? Today we live in a world filled with many opinions and unfortunately not filled with a lot of love, especially the love of God. As seen at the services yesterday and the people here today celebrating Terry, so many are of the same opinion of Terry Carl and feel the love for him as well as the love he showed to others. I know I did as well as many others who prayed to God for Terry's healing and if not for his strength and his peace. We also prayed for Ellen to have strength and peace as she stayed continuously by his side. Terry and I knew each other for many, many years. We went to grammar school, junior high, and high school together. Although we lost touch for years, we saw each other at reunions, and Terry was still the nice, kind, and friendly guy he always was. He gave you a great smile and a sincere, warm hug. I was so excited when I first heard that Terry and Ellen had reconnected 
and it was at one of our reunions. I think it was the last one we had had. And they decided to get together again and then get married sometime later. It was amazing, but not surprising, that Terry would drive to Jersey each weekend to spend time with Ellen. A few times we spoke on the phone while he was driving in good old New York traffic, and but even then he remained calm, because that was just the way Terry was. He was calm, considerate, patient, and he just loved Ellen. We spoke as he struggled to get the surgery accepted for his transplants, and then finally after he received it, we texted or spoke a few times through the battle and the healing. He was a trooper for sure. He always kept faith and a good spirit. I mentioned to him at the last reunion we had had that we may try to start up a Calvin Alumni Association, and I asked, if I needed help, would you be able to help me? Of course, without hesitation, Terry said, yes, Phil, whatever you need. So when the time came, I reached out, and Terry did all the paperwork and filing, as well as picked up the course for us to start the association. I told him, now you're going to have to be my vice president. And he agreed, and I even got to visit him at his beautiful office here and see how prestigious he really was. And he introduced me to a few people in the office at his good, as his good longtime friend, and it meant so much to me. A few years later, I nominated him and we honored Terry with the Hall of Fame Award, and a plaque still remains in Calhoun High School. Alumni, friends, and family who came to the dinner in support were so happy for him. Terry was humbled, but he was excited. As the bio in the obituary reads, Terry was honored many times over and helped give his time, legal knowledge, advice, support, and love to many organizations. The one he started for his niece touched my heart, only showing how big his heart was again and again. Terry had a great sense of humor, as it's been mentioned, and when he met my older daughter for the first time, he called her my clone. And she does look a lot like me, but she's prettier. <laughs> and that's how he would always refer to her. How's your clone doing? The same daughter and boyfriend at the time came with my husband and I to the casino night that Terry and Ellen ran for the Mahi 2. That same night, the boyfriend, now my son-in-law, asked my husband if he could marry my daughter. So besides the auction items we purchased, and my husband being the top winner that night, we have a great memory of that event. I told Terry, maybe Ellen too, I don't remember, um, that night, and he was so excited for us. Again, just being a wonderful, kind, caring friend. More recently, Terry had reached out and asked me to join him and Ellen and Nancy to form a committee to organize our 50th high school reunion. No, we don't look like we're in 50 years. <laughs> uh, of course, I said yes, and I asked for us to include other years as we had done in the past, and everyone agreed. It was great to hear his voice and his humor, as he and I usually made the jokes on our group phone calls. Even on the last few calls, he was having some pain, but he did not let on, and he tried to be part of it all. He will still be part of it that night. I know he will be there, and I think this picture should be there too, Ellen. I wish I was able to see him more. He always said the beach house was open to come, but I never made it there. I do know how much he enjoyed the solitude and peace he felt there, and he sent me a few pictures of the beautiful sunset and the sunrise. I hope, Ellen, that you feel that same solitude and peace again as you sit there, and I know Terry will be sitting right next to you. As people have mentioned, and I didn't know everyone, but I'm happy to hear it, look around for the red cardinals. Mm -hmm. And Rick told me about the wine bottle. Which <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, someone you love is visiting you. I can only pray that more people in this world are either already like Terry or become like Terry. We all can learn from him. Terry was a seed that was planted by God, and we are all parts of what blossomed from his goodness. He was blessed, and we were blessed to know him. My prayers will continue to pray for Terry's soul, and the love and prayers from me and my family, to you, Ellen, your children, to the brothers, their families, all who are here who love Terry. As we say in a prayer, eternal rest grant unto you, Terry, O Lord, 
and let the perpetual light shine upon him. May Terry's soul and the souls of all the faithfully departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. I will miss you soon. Thank you. No, we keep on making uh, allusions to Terry walking around with no shoes on. Um, I just want you all to know that yesterday he was buried with no shoes on. <laughs> so we were very happy about that. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, anyway, that's Terry. Um, Matt, you want to come on up? Matt Inductivo is uh, another graduate of Hope House, another graduate of our law firm, and one of Terry's closest friends. And as a result of Terry moving to Jersey and, uh, and Matt moving to L.A., I've probably saved a, each year about $40,000 in food. <laughs> because I had a propensity for nice restaurants. And, uh, and I was the, the golden ticket. <laughs> Matt, he's like a son to me. And as so many of the guys at Hope House, and he meant the world to, to Terry. And has been part of the past few months. Uh, Ellen's kept us all involved, but uh, Maddie. Thank you. you. You messed up the order. Tommy was supposed to go first, and then I met. <laughs> okay, I was supposed to go first, and then Tommy. Um, you know, and, and I say that jokingly, but I was, I told Ellen I was, I was worried I'd break down up here because, uh, you know, I'll get to that, but I was, I was devastated to hear when he had a few days left. Um, to paint a quick picture, you know, to, to Tommy's point, I was, uh, 23 years old, uh, when I started working, I had the opportunity to work at the law firm. And prior to working at the law firm, I lived two and a half years at, at Hope House. Um, for those who don't know, Hope House isn't, except, it isn't for angels, right? You didn't, you didn't end up there because you were a nice, quiet boy from Brooklyn like I was. And, and I just want to point out that I came from Brooklyn when it was pre-yuppies, when there were no hipsters, when there wasn't any gentrification. And so I'm trying to paint this picture because you take this kid who comes from impoverished, basically poverty, you stick him in suburbia or Hope House, and then you give him this opportunity to work with white collar professionals for the first time, and it's an amazing experience, right? You don't really deal with lawyers unless you're dealing with legal aid in Brooklyn. You know, you don't, you don't deal with these professionals. So, you know, I always bring up Tommy because my first time at the law firm, it was like, this is great. This is amazing. Like, you know, I'm not doing any labor. You know, I'm not swinging a hammer. There's no mean people. You know, people look like they know what they're doing. And I, and I was just in awe, right, that I had this opportunity. And you meet Terry, right, who, you know, I'm this young, gullible kid, wet behind the ears. And one of the first things he does to me when I meet him, we had a, a office uh, that had a room, like a fishbowl, so you could see through it. And he would always be sitting there with clients. And... <laughs> And he had this ability, when the clients were looking, signing a paper, he'd slip you the bird. <laughs> and as a, a you know, first time you experience that, you're like, oh my goodness. And, um, you know, super gullible, you know, and I'm walking around my first week there, and he comes up to me, he's like, Nobody likes you here. I hope you know that. <laughs> and that was Terry. You know, and, now, and to Tommy's point, like, he was just consistent and calm and welcoming and loving and, and encouraging and supportive and compassionate and, and uh, give you the shirt off his back. And, um, you know, I, I think about when I lived at Hope House, he, he was like a legend, right? Because if you talk to the guys I lived with, and you ask them their charges, and you're like, who's your lawyer? He goes, oh, Terry Carr. Dude, how are you not in prison? You know, he's like the Johnny Cochran of lawyers. <laughs> you know, like, it was amazing to meet this guy, so he's a legend. I get the opportunity to go to court with him one day, not as a client, for the record, <laughs> and um, he knows everybody. The court officers, hey, Terry, what's going on, buddy? All the lawyers, hey, Terry, what's going on? You know, the judges are saying hello to them. You're walking around like, yep, I'm with Terry, you know? Like, <laughs> hey, you're of Central Iceland, but we're And um, as a kid, it just it, it put an impression on me, you know? Here's this guy, this amazing, kind guy, and everyone loves him, you know? Everyone loves one, you know? Um, <laughs> 
I, I, I was like hesitant to write things down, but I knew I, I would forget things I really wanted to say, so I apologize for cheating and looking at my notes. Um, he left an impression on me because I was so infatuated with law and work in this office. And he said, Matt, I'll never forget this. We're just social workers in suits. And he meant that, right? And if you knew anything about Terry Call, he didn't become an attorney for the prestige of it. He wasn't driven by money. He was driven by purpose and helping people. And there's very few people I've met in society that are driven with that passion, that ability to help another human being, expecting nothing in return. And um, it was amazing to have that opportunity to work with a guy like that, who just gave, 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 gave. And, uh, you know, I, I, I joke around, but Terry, Terry's, at least I, what I took his affection to me, he would be like, <laughs> he'd either give me the bird or he'd say, you're such an asshole. Right? And sometimes it was warranted, and, I, and I show, I'll share one time when it was warranted. I was allegedly going 150 miles an hour on a motorcycle, and I, was, I had to go to Terry because I was in a lot of trouble, right? And I was working at the law firm, which is more embarrassing, right? I'm pulling out like a, a business card with the law firm, and the guy's like, I can take your license, your bike, and send you to jail now. But because we represented the PBA attorneys, thanks for that, they didn't do all that. And because of a lot of PBA cards of people in this room, that didn't happen. But I, Terry, you know, when I go to Terry and I'm telling him this story, he's just shaking his head. And, you know, I try to make lighter. I go, Terry, they racially profiled me because I'm half Spanish. You know what I mean? He's like, underneath the helmet, they knew you were half Spanish. <laughs> and I go, Terry, this is Suffolk County. You get two counts of being Spanish in a white zone. It's a felony, man. You know, this is serious. And he would just shake his head, and, and, and he went to court, and, uh, and he got me only a, a fine, which is amazing, right? And, and that's who Terry was, man. Like, he, he would show up, he did what he said, and he, he meant what he mean, and, and he would help you or anybody. And, and you know, when, when Ellen asked me, and, and his family asked me to, to have the honor and privilege of being a pallbearer, you know, it, it meant the world to me, because here's this guy who literally doesn't know, but carried me through so much in life, and now I had the opportunity to carry him to his final resting place, right? And um, I knew this was gonna happen. <laughs> Terry was literally the uncle I never had, right? And I'm not gonna tear you or bore you with a story of, of, of woe or sob stories, but he was literally the uncle I never had. And when Charlie talks about saving approximately, you know, I had on average, conservative average, three times a week between breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I was with Terry and Charlie, spending time with them, eating, either, you know, during those times. I spent a lot of time with this guy. And um, I was so blessed and fortunate to have a role model, a mentor, a friend, an uncle, an attorney, a, a, a counselor. You know, he had the amazing ability to just listen to you. And he wouldn't judge you, you know. And um, when Ellen called, when I spoke to Ellen and she told me he had a few days, you know, I was devastated. And the truth be told, I was more devastated to hear that than some of my own family members passing because that's how much I love this man. And um, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to, to come here and show up. I'm grateful that you asked me to, to, to speak, even though I was voluntold to speak. You were voluntold. Um, you know, and I'll share that a quick story. Ellen texts me, uh, I heard you want to say a few words at, at, at Terry's uh, celebration of life. And I write back immediately, I'd be honored to. She goes, well, that's not what I heard. I heard you were told you were going to speak. <laughs> and I was like, well, Ellen, you know, I thought you were asking me. So I was trying to be But yeah, that, that man over there with the mustache said, you know, you will speak at, at, at the, the event. And uh, just grateful to know him and you. So thank you. Uh, so I, I saw at the church yesterday, I couldn't say something. It was this beautiful church. It was just beautiful. And uh, just a wonderful reverend that was close friends with, uh, with Terry. And I couldn't use, like, foul language in the church. I just couldn't do it. But now that you're all here, <laughs> so I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. So Ellen, Ellen shared this with me. So Terry's in the, uh, in the hospital and in, in a tremendous amount of pain. And the doctor comes in. And says, how many fingers do I have up in left hand? He says, three. And then he says, well, how many do I have up in the right? And Terry just went like this. <laughs> Which he did to me on many occasions. <laughs> but the other word that he loved to call Maddie and me 
Um, it, it, it emanated from all the ways I broke his chops all the time. But Ellen called me when he had the transplant the, the day he had it and said he's coming out and he'll be in the, the recovery room. And it was late at night and I, I asked her if I could come in and I came into the city. And he was laying there all with wires and tubes in him and, you know, in bad shape. And I leaned over to him and I grabbed him and I said, uh, I just have some bad news. And he said, what's the matter? He says, they couldn't do, I said, they couldn't do anything with your nose. And, <laughs> and he turned to me and he just looked at me and said, you're such an asshole. <laughs> the other story I told yesterday, which is one of my favorite stories, was about his shoes, never wearing shoes. So I think one of the reasons he didn't like wearing them is because some days he showed up with two different shoes that were two different colors. And uh, this one particular day, all the all the staff came up and said, he's got to, you got to make fun of him. I go, no, no, leave me alone. So the next day, he's at the, at the copy machine, and I, and I kind of snuck up behind him and said, hey, how you doing? I heard you had a rough day yesterday with the shoes. He goes, oh, finally, you're saying something. And he looks down at my feet, and I had a snowshoe on my right foot and a hockey skate on my left foot. And he looked at me and says, you're such an ass. And I know I'm going to hear him calling me an asshole on many occasions as I tell stories about him, but I will miss being called that asshole all the time. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's anybody else that'd like to say something. Steve? Yep, great. Another one of our Hope House uh, guys that uh, came through with a lot of uh, a lot of mountains to climb. Another young attorney here on Long Island. And uh, one of the, uh, Terry's really close friends. So, Steve Ciliano. Thank you, Charlie. There's three reasons I'm able to stand here tonight and talk to you guys. One, that gentleman, two is Hope House, and three is Terry. I think one of my fondest memories of Terry wasn't even an interaction we had. It was an interaction he had with my mother. When I was younger, I was a little bit of a knucklehead and found myself in a, <laughs> found myself in a particular situation and um, why I had to attend to something for lack of a better term. Terry spent three hours with my mom didn't know her from a hole in the wall. Sure had a gazillion other things to do that day. But that's how much he cared for someone he didn't even know. That he sat with her for three hours. Three hours. Why I'm sure his day was crazy busy. And I never forgot that. That, that was Terry. That was the epitome of Terry. Fast forward a few years, when my wife and I were welcoming our first child, my firstborn son, so excited. My father's birthday is June 12th, and on June 8th, I turned to my wife, and this was the day I almost got divorced, by the way, <laughs> and said, hey, do you think you can wait a couple more days to give birth until it's my father's birthday? <laughs> Didn't go over too hot. <laughs> Did not go over too hot. But the second best thing that could have happened did happen. My firstborn son shares a birthday with Terry. And I don't think that's a coincidence. He couldn't be on my father's birthday. And this was just, he couldn't have asked for anything more. So thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Jimmy? Jimmy Cosgrove, we're all getting a lot older. He was 14, 15, 16 when we first met, but he's a Noble House graduate. Yes, sir. 
mm-hmm. of Jimmy, and I, I couldn't pass up the thing to. I'm here today because of Charlie and Terry. And Terry was always there, you know. He would, uh, he would drop everything, return a call, you know, and never, you know. As I went on and my life proceeded, um, I'll never forget, Charlie married me and another friend of mine in his backyard. You know, when I was marrying my wife from uh, health benefits, and so the other guy's wife was marrying the guy from health benefits. And, you know, it's, um, and I would turn around, and when that, you know, there's a million other times that Terry was there, I, I would call him, and he, he would always just be there with a, a thing. I, I would go to the house in Medford and, and do a little work for him, and and try to pay him back for all the things that he did because, you know, he was 1-800-LAWYER. You know, I mean, and I would get myself into all these channels. And uh, he would just give me simple advice. And like I said, he wouldn't charge. He had this unconditional love and genuine compassion that, that, that I saw in very few people. You know, I mean, it was, to me, you know, my whole life was a con, so everything else was a con. You know what I mean? I was such deep crap that we were all crap. And he helped me peel the onion and, and do what I had to do and, uh, and help me out. So when that marriage failed, and, and, and before, and he knew because I would talk to him about personal stuff on a pretty regular basis. And, and he was at, at his home and he already had somebody from uh, an alumni of Noble House living there. And I didn't even ask him. And I own a home and, you know, and, and all this stuff. And, and he turned around and he said, Jimmy, he goes, you're welcome here any time. And the fact that you did not have to ask, and he was intuitive enough to know what was going on with you in a genuine way. You know what I mean? I, I see that in very few people. You know what I mean? Probably none. And, and the fact that, you know, he, it was a two-way thing. I remember he had um, uh, people with disabilities that, that he was in charge of, and, and they had apartments, and he would say, Jimmy, we got to go to this one, this one, and this one. And he would have me go there and fix their plumbing. You know what I mean? And he would drag me out. And, and he, looked, he gave me the sense of being able to give back. You know what I mean? Because that's what he did. He did it throughout my whole life. You know what I mean? You know, and um, I'm old now. You know what I mean? I look at it and I'm here putting full sentences together and having a great life, married to the love of my life. You know, like he had a second chance with him, I had a second chance with Marie. And my life is truly full because of what this man gave me. You know, and Charlie, you know, yeah, they, they, they were a team, you know what I mean? But, but Terry was always, oh, I'll coach him. He loved it, he was just, you know, I remember lots of times showing up, you know, to the house in Medford just because I, I needed a, I needed an ear and a sound piece of mind to nudge me. I called True North. And they would just push me a little bit true north and make me see. Because like I said, I believe this. I was in such deep crap, I believe my own crap. You know what I mean? And they, they gave me a way of getting out of hell itself. You know what I mean? And the issues I had, like Matty said, the uncle, whatever, he was a constant in my life, but I had no constants. You know, and I had a million issues that I didn't know how to sort through. And it just helped me to be the man you see before you today. You know, and uh, I'll be forever grateful and you always have a big piece of my heart. And thank you. Anybody else? Maddie? You, you people may be here till midnight, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. You lost a great man. Um, I grew up in Port Jefferson. I was 
I would like to call myself one of Nicky Russo's best friends. Uh, Charlie was my deck hockey coach, my little league coach, my soccer coach. He would put us in his Bronco with, with orange peels when it was too cold out. So I knew the, I knew the whole Russo clan. I knew Terry um, before I got into the worst trouble of my life. And um, in 2021, I was facing a lot of time in prison. I got mixed up with the wrong people. I was a child of divorce. Nobody was watching me anymore. Um, growing up in a family that you had to be home for dinner at six o'clock every night. And, Nobody was watching anymore. And um, first met Charlie when I was in prison, and he wasn't so nice to me. He was disappointed, and um, you know, still, still, still Charlie. And the next person I saw in court was Terry Crawl, and that image is something that I'll never forget. She was comforting, and she was always there. He was a man that was busy, and always took time, and was comforting. And Matt said it best. When we were in those courts, it was sleazy. It was a lot of bad people. And when he walked in, the room lit up. The judges knew him, smiling, all the court reporters. He was a special man. And being with him was comforting. And I owe my entire life to him. I'm a partner in a top 25 CPA firm. I'm responsible for 250 people. I have two beautiful daughters and a wife. And I owe everything to him and Charlie and Father Frank. When Charlie reached out earlier in the week, I don't live. I don't live in Long Island anymore. And I feel removed. And looking at this picture, I feel like I haven't done enough. But it really moved me in, in thinking about who that man was. And I wish I had the experience of Matt and others of being around more. I think a man like Terry drives me. She wanted me wanted to be more of a better person. But I do know that everything I have is from him, and from the time that he took and. You know, growing up thinking about lawyers driving Ferraris and, and doing all those things, he was none of that. He was at Christmas Magic. He was at Hope House. He gave everything he could to people that were less fortunate. And I owe him everything in my life. And thank you for letting him do his thing. And, you know, really, thank you so much. Somebody back there? Up. Be tough, but my name is Pam Ilecki. I'm from Hamilton too. I've been I've been fortunate to know Terry for a good portion of my life. Um, when he when Ellen dragged him to camp. I'm not sure exactly how that went, how much he wanted to be um, there all the time. Um, we're fortunate now to be part of a very thriving organization, but we are not always in that position. Um, and when Terry got involved in camp, he was so impassioned and quite frankly, didn't really have any reason to be other than his love for his family and his love for all of us and his love for what we are able to do to give back to our community of um, campers over the past 80 some odd years. Um, he came to camp and he was able to really kickstart our fundraising efforts. Um, anyone here who's ever been to a casino night, that was Terry's kind of baby, his brainchild, his, um, his main effort for us to be able to really raise funds that made a tremendous difference to our organization. Um, having a relatively small girls camp in the woods north of New York City run by all volunteers is not the easiest task. Um, it takes a lot of love and a lot of labor of love and it's a lot of time and effort and we are so fortunate to have Terry on our side for so many years. Um, I was I want to say I was a staff member, maybe even a camper still, back when Terry first got involved in camp. And I will never forget, as a staff member, him, he and Ellen spoke to our entire staff, and he told us the importance of working for an organization like we did and being able to be proud of the work that we did and give back to the people who were all at camp. And then I was fortunate to serve on the board of directors as well with Terry. Um, and he brought a lot of light, a lot of life, a lot of excitement to our board meetings, which could sometimes be, I'm not to say dull, but <laughs> wrong. <laughs> and 
I have been known in my life, personally, um, to not hide my emotions very well, or to hide how I feel about things. And Terry was one of the few people never to tell me to fix my face. Um, he was always, whenever we'd hear something funny or I'd make some sort of reaction to something, <clears throat> Terry would always tell me after, he's like, that's the best part, you gotta keep doing that. <laughs> so, just on behalf of Cammy Heat too, and half of me as well, we're just so fortunate to have Terry on our side for so long. And we're the organiz organization we are now because of his efforts and because of everything that he's done for us over the last tens of years um, and before that. So, just so fortunate to have him in our corner for so many years. We love him. <laughs> Mike? This is Terry's brother, Mike, all the way from Kansas. Got here on the stagecoach just fine. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things I'd like to say, and Charlie stole some of my thunder because the, the finger thing in the hospital was a classic, and I guess the doctor really laughed. I wouldn't even say that because I didn't think that was the type of audience that, <laughs> that Charlie broke the ice there. One more story. My wife is from a farm family in Clay Center, Kansas. Well, first time she came back with me to New York to meet my family was at Thanksgiving or Christmas. It was Christmas. Mom was so busy, try to be impressive and make us great for her. She cooked the turkey and she cooked mashed potatoes. That what you do. She made mashed potatoes, green beans, corn, everything you can possibly imagine. And we all sit down to have this great meal. And there was one plate left, and it was Terry's. My mom walks in, puts two English muffins down, and <laughs> peanut butter. <laughs> Oreos and milk. What's that? Oreos and milk. Oh, and Oreos and milk, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can, at least on my part, end it with this. I said this yesterday, and I don't know if I said it well enough. But... Number one, thank you everybody for being here. He talked about his friends all the time. And as I see this today, I can understand why he spoke so highly of everybody. You guys meant everything to him. You were really special. And if there was a lesson to be learned by all this, and I said this yesterday, I hope I'm not being redundant. Don't wait to tell that person next to you how, how much you care for them and how much they care for you. We don't know if we had that opportunity whether he heard us or not. But I wish I could have told him last week or the week before. So grab that person's hand next to you and just say, hey, you're okay. You're okay. I wish we had had that opportunity. And I hope he heard us. I think he did. Thanks so much. Kim Joyce now occupies Terry's office, which was next to me. So I, uh, I, I, I still, <laughs> I still have a good friend there, and uh, Terry's good friend. They were great friends uh, with all the matrimonials that they suffered through. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you did. So, okay. So I, I met Terry circa 1992. I was a very young lawyer, and we were adversaries, and. <laughs> it's very hard to call Terry an adversary, <laughs> even when he's against you. And he was experienced, and it was, uh, I remember the case, tobacco versus tobacco. And it was my first real client of my own, and we were going to have a custody trial, and I had the young mom who I was sure was going to win custody. And Terry kept just saying, Kimmy, you're going to lose. Like, you, you're gonna, I can't lose. She's like, Mom, you're the baby. 
So we have the trial, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm learning, and I'm having trouble getting something. I don't remember what in evidence, and he pulls me aside at lunch and goes, listen, ask this, do that, <laughs> and he helps me get it in. <laughs> and we became fast friends, and just, you know, ever since. And he was always somebody who lit up a room, helped you, just help lawyers you know and everybody's telling their stories but even from the profession of you know uh, you know a, a, a peer he was always there he was always there to help you know who did i call when my family members got in a little bit of trouble <laughs> terry <laughs> and he fixed it <laughs> so i love that man um, i miss him so sorry for everything's lost I don't want to miss anyone. Everybody. Well, I I'm so glad Terry heard all of this. I'm so glad that we allayed all his fears about nobody showing up. <laughs> Everybody did, you know. The camp the high school, Melville House, Hope House, all the lives that he turned around, all the people he helped. Um, you know, it, it's the biggest loss that I can't, that I've ever had. And uh, you heard some of the guys talking about, you know, that, that we were a team, you know. It was a good, good guy, and then the, the guy that you went to uh, the bad guy that knocked you over the head and the good guy that picked you up. I was the bad guy that knocked him over the head. And then I would turn to him and said, all right, get in there and do your thing. So, and uh, he did it every time, every time. He taught me more life lessons than I can ever. I, I could sit here and talk for hours about the people he affected. Um, but I got to talk one minute about how he affected me because he taught me how to live my life taught me so much about life um, and from the day, first day I met him in that room when he was clean shaven and uh, came into that room of beards uh, to the day that I saw him at the hospital for the last time um, he taught me about strength because I've never ever in my life witnessed a man go through so much trauma so much stress so much pain and still <clears throat> show us that it's okay, it's okay. Um, he talked to me about being depressed and you know, not understanding why it was happening to him, but he also then said, but I have to accept it. This is my fate, this is what it is. Just make sure you take care of Ellen. You know, that's all he, that he ever cared about. Um, he loved his family, his brothers, he loved everyone. And you heard from the men that came up here and, and bravely told you about their lives. Um, that there's so much behind each one of those stories, but Terry was always the person that was there to make sure it all worked out, it all worked out fine. So whether it was the, the bar and the people that were <laughs> friends of his in the legal profession, or the young men that he helped, or the campers, or the high school friends, or his family, I'm going to miss my partner, my brother. There's nobody like him. Nobody, and there never will be. Thank you all for coming. Please stick around and mingle, talk around some of the people you met. We got the joint and delay. <laughs>
<laughs> because I don't know anything like that.